Case in point is hybrid corn. Hybrid corn was developed in the 1930s, essentially by cross uh, breeding, if that's the right word there, cross breeding corn, uh, uh, you were able to develop strains that had higher yields. And you can see here from a very famous study by Zvi Grilichis uh, that the pattern of diffusion of hybrid corn where the y-axis is the percent of farmers who are uh, corn farmers who are adopting it uh, had this elongated S shaped. Uh, interestingly of course when you look about at this here is that the S shape was state-based. Uh, Iowa were actually early adopters from a state perspective although there were early adopters even within Iowa and then it took off pretty quickly and it was basically all done uh, by the end of World War II. Uh, Wisconsin had a slower uptake than Kentucky and Alabama uh, was well behind uh, you know some in this uh, looking here 20-25 years behind Iowa in adopting hybrid corn now, there's an interesting question as to why that was the case. Well, as it turned out, uh, where it was adopted was where it would be most uh, profitable. And it was going to be most profitable to develop these seeds, and they had to be developed from the environment in Iowa. And it took a little longer for it to occur in Alabama, where it made economic sense to do so. So this is just profit-maximizing behavior on the part of, in this case, the customers. But the point we want to grasp here is that the market to S curve was showing up is as far away as uh, uh, as long ago as 1930s. This has happened in everything. This uh, plots somewhat uh, complicatedly, I guess, uh, all manner of innovations uh, and their adoption rate for households, electricity, ranges, refrigerators, Refrigerator is very interesting, took off very quickly, you can see there in the 1940s. Radio, color television, color television, that was a popular product. Telephone, actually quite slow. Cars, microwaves, the VCR, also very quick, <laughs> even though it's no longer with us. Dishwashers, slower. Uh, the cellular phone uh, was just happening as the start of this diagram, as we know it took off rather quickly. Uh, it's quite interesting to see how these things occur. So the same pattern occurs. Now, and they're not all a smooth S-curve. You know, things like the clothes washer were interrupted by the war, as you can see there, and, and so history can get in the way. But if there's ever a relationship you can bank on in business, it's this one. Just to see how, uh, what's the uh, uh, underlying basis of it? What's the theory behind why we see this? elongated S-curve. Well, it's basically a life cycle model of the product. The first people to adopt a product are called basically innovators. <laughs> They're the people who order anything off Kickstarter, are always first in line for an Apple product. Then there is another group called the early adopters. You know, they don't buy sight unseen, but they like to have things early and they're happy to experiment. Stuff gets really serious when you go into the early majority and the late majority. This is the group of people that adopts because it now makes sense. All the kinks have been worked out and the product is uh, a must have, at least for a certain group of people. And then finally, the adoption rate slows again because you've got the laggards and laggards are slow to adopt. Uh, we all know these people. Uh, we laugh at them. Well, I do. Uh, but they, they do uh, uh, arise here. Okay. And eventually, once the laggards are adopting, <laughs> you actually know that the product is not going to have much more growth after that. The tough thing is being able to predict the takeoff into the early majority and then how big that whole lump in the middle actually is and so what the total penetration of the product might be 
And people get this wrong all the time because right when you are taking off, it looks like it could go on forever. But we know eventually the S is going to bend back and you're going to get a limit. To show you how hard that is to predict, let's look at the iPad. Up until 2013, look at the growth in the iPad. It was basically exponential. It was increasing every year. But what's interesting is what happened after that. The growth slowed. The growth slowed. And in fact, where you can see there, you can see a definite process by in 2010, you had the innovators. 2011, you had the uh, early adopters. The early majority was 2012 and 13. And the late majority was 2013 to 2015 or 16. And then the iPad hit some steady equilibrium that was basically based on, you know, uh, existing customers. Uh, needing to replace their iPad or not. So there was a lot of discussion, of course, that, you know, Apple had missed out, etc. But actually, as it turned out, that Apple had actually captured that entire tablet market. Everybody else who came in in 2013 were already coming into a declining market and st stood no chance to catch up. So this is where the S-curve is quite useful. Is It's a useful concept but there are different ways the S could play out. It could be short and stunted. It could be long and elongated. It could be very rapid. You don't know. But what we do suspect is your choice of which early adopters you target is going to matter for how that scenario plays out. So here are some of the basic characteristics that you would look at for innovators, early adopters, early majority, later job, the majority laggards. Uh, this might be useful to uh, come back and look at if you were thinking about the full trajectory uh, of formulating your strategy. And here is a more amusing one uh, of that. Um, but apparently, when Ashton Kutcher has a product, then you know something about it. Uh, when you find a, f a Costco or Sam's Club, it's like the end of the road. <laughs> there might be truth to that. There's no empirical evidence to uh, to justify that whatsoever. So what's interesting is that entrepreneurial opportunities exist at each stage of the market S curve. In other words, there's this big long S perk for a whole category like a tablet, but there are little opportunities, little S curves that come in for improvements and other things within that. Your initial customers are your critical choice in all of this, and it may not be easy for you to change tack afterwards. The question you also have to ask, are the early adopters the best or the worst customers of the incumbent? So the question is, that's really a, quite a difficult question to answer. Normally with a disruptive viewpoint, and we'll come to this a little later, what you're targeting with early adopters are people who are underserved by the market. So you're trying to find people who just don't like the current products very much. They would like a features that the current products do not have, and you can target them first. Another approach to early adopters is to target the best customers of incumbents. Okay? That is to produce a product that draws away people who are already uh, quite tied to um, the previous product. Now, this is something that was a hallmark of Tesla's strategy. It was going for the top of the market. That's why uh, I, for one, don't see it, Tesla as pursuing a disruptive strategy because they were never pursuing customers that were dissatisfied. They were pursuing customers who were car lovers and better still, luxury car lovers. That's an interesting way for this to go.